Welcome to the Kielder Observatory podcast and this month, uh, for the first time ever, we are breaking new ground because myself and Dan are in the same location. Uh, this podcast uh, began uh, in the in the depths, I say in the height, but actually the depths mm. of, uh, of, of lockdown, I think, in 2020 when we first started doing it. So three years further on, mm. and we're actually recording this in the same location. And um, we've managed it. Not only we're we doing that, but we are actually, you might hear it slightly echoing in the background, we're at Kielder Observatory. Yeah, beautifully acoustically treated Kielder Observatory. Well, I think, you know, <laughs> if you're a singer, you, you probably take these conditions. Hey, we've never thought about that, actually. Singers here. We used to have, occasionally, um, during New Year, we used to have Kaylee dancers and stuff. Okay. Um, I mean, that's not my idea of a good time, but well, some people enjoyed it, you know. That's right, so lots of people do. The acoustics of this room may lend itself to a good tenor. Yeah. Maybe we need that. I was going to say, it's, it's fairly cramped for a Kaylee, I've got a say in here, but... Operatic <laughs> under the stars. That's right. Well, you could do that, couldn't you? You could have you could have some some operatic, so be quite atmospheric. Yeah, you know, on a night maybe when there's, you know, got the meteor showers or whatever. Mm. You know, you've got, you've got your local tenor there belting out the hits. That's an idea. Make it happen. Make that happen. We can record that. I think that would be really good, actually. There's a, there's Opera a new idea. under the stars. You know what happened, though, is we'd, we'd arrange this. We'd have it planned for, for months and months and months, and then it would rain. Yeah, well, you could always rebrand it to Soggy Operatics. And, soggy uh, Operatics. And, <laughs> and uh, everybody's happy, aren't they? Great stuff. Well, it's, it's great to be here, and, um, and, and we're here during the day. Mm. Uh, it is actually quite soggy outside at this moment in time because mm. um, the, the weather conditions I tend to bring to Kielda when I do come on my visit, it uh, usually involves some level of cloud. It's your fault. Yeah. Every, every time. Every, <laughs> every time. It's a rain cloud following you. It's so you, you increase the dew point and it becomes humid when you Yeah, when I'm you like, you know, like, like Olaf in Frozen, where he goes around with his permanent snow flurry oh, over yeah. his head. It's like, I'm the sort of same with, with fog, I think. <laughs> it's just how it is. Now, we, there is some work going on. We're here during the day. Obviously, there's mm. no visitors here. Uh, the, the clouds are um, very much out uh, and it's daytime. Um, but there is some work going on outside. The, the, the radio telescope there has is. got a, a couple of dudes up there uh, in a, on a ladder with umbrellas. They've got umbrellas. A, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of umbrellas <laughs> there up, the, up the ladder uh, with, with umbrellas. Um, it's one of the uh, funniest things. <laughs> His words earlier were really funny. He was like, it's going to rain all day. Mm, probably. Is it going to rain tomorrow? Mm, probably. <laughs> you just don't know. It's just Britain. He's come well equipped with a, with a good amount of umbrellas, though. Yeah, well, they're yeah. our umbrellas. Oh, right, okay. Thinking about it, we should have got a big gazebo and just covered the radio telescope in a massive gazebo for the day. So they're fixing that. So the radio telescope has been, um, it's had a couple of faults lately. Yeah. It was installed, what, about 18 months? Yeah, about 18 months. Like it's progressively had its yeah. issues. And, and it seems to have all been stemmed from the, um, the, the Storm Arwen saga. I think there was some... Um, Unintended penetration of water mm. uh, at, uh, during during that whole debacle, and it was really funny because when we were moving the dish for ages, I was going, well, "That's really weird." When I point it there, it's fine, but then I move it, and it's not okay. So, what could be going on there? Anyway, we went up some ladders, and loads of water fell out of it. So ah. that was probably the reason. Um, and then it's had a few other. Uh, so we fixed that, and um, then it's had a, a few other little teething problems. Just getting used to the weather here in Kielda. The humidity of Britain can be quite uh, quite challenging for a lot of, of uh, mechanical stuff. Mm. And this, of course, being a big piece of mechanical operational material, it's just degraded. I mean, considering um, how exposed it is here, because you, mm. you, you drive up this two-mile track, um, and you're right on the tops. So when the winds get up, you yeah. know, my first thought would be like, well, you've got a big dish. Yeah. Obviously, it's got some holes in it to let the air through, but obviously yeah. it's going to get battered up here, isn't it? I'm surprised that yeah. wind damage hasn't been a bigger thing, if I'm honest. Well, wind damage is something that it was designed in mind of because um, one of these antennas was, was, and I think it was, sighted there eventually was supposed to be going to Singapore and Hong Kong and they get some really bad typhoons there. So they wanted to design this piece of kit with with that in mind, that there could be big typhoons that blow, blow these um, pieces of apparatus around. So they parked themselves upwards 
to because that's the the, the most aerodynamic that mm. it can be. And then um, when the wind gets too much, if it does get too intense, then the panels are designed, even though they've got holes in, they're designed to release and mm. they'll fly away. Um, ah. But the main piece of the equipment yeah. will stay where it is. Yeah. So they're designed with a lot of um, weather considerations in mind, but it just seems to be that the the humidity has really got into this uh uh, this piece of apparatus so hopefully they'll fix that and then we'll have an operational dish by the end of the week and that would be nice wouldn't it that'll be good that'll mm. be good and gives you another thing well other options to, to, to look at what's going on in the in the sky of course so when the when the weather isn't isn't great that's the irony so yeah exactly uh, look at invisible light instead that's right um so they're working on that but they've had to come from italy so these are the experts yeah um obviously uh these kind of radio telescope experts are, are not to a penny and no. certainly not many around northumberland so they've, they've flown in <laughs> from from italy to uh, to fix this in the rain so hopefully back in business soon um now tell us about one of the <clears throat> one of the observatories the the um is it the 16 inch telescope yes it's had a a, a, a bit of an event over the last um, few weeks or so, and uh, it's got a new name. It has, and some this was really catalyzed by the fact that the there used to be two different size telescopes in this observatory. We used to have a twenty inch telescope down in the far end, and then a sixteen inch telescope in the middle. Well, actually, originally it was a fourteen inch telescope in there, um, and. Uh, when we when Sir Patrick Moore died in 2012, we thought we'd dedicate that biggest observatory to him. So we renamed it the uh, Sir Patrick Moore Observatory. And then we took the 20-inch telescope out of there and put in a 16-inch telescope. So what that meant was that both observatories now have 16-inch telescopes, but we were still calling the one in the middle the 16-inch observatory, right. even though they both have 16-inch telescopes. So we wanted to um, recognise some some scientists who haven't always been recognised through history as much as they should have and celebrate them uh, for their own achievements as well. And so we, we put together a short list. Uh, it went out to vote internally with volunteers and the staff and, uh, and we arrived with the name that we chose, which is the Caroline Herschel Observatory. Um, and Caroline Herschel uh, is the brother of, of William Herschel. And many people have heard of William Herschel, but lesser so his sister, who equally was working with William Herschel to discover some of the most incredible things that were discovered through that time. Mostly comets, loads and loads of comets, um, some which bear her name as well. Um, but what's also really interesting about her as well is she was the first woman to receive a salary as a scientist and the first woman in England to hold a government position. Wow. So this was she was mm. an incredible, uh, significant figure of a time, uh, as well as the contributions to science, as well as supporting a brother and then uh, everything else as well. And um, so it was absolutely fitting to to choose that and and rename that observatory the Caroline Herschel Observatory or the Caroline Her sorry it's the Caroline let me just get a name correct Caroline Lucretia Herschel Observatory. It's a great name. It's, it's a, a good crucial, name, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, very grand name. Um, and she died at the age of 97, would you believe, in uh, 1848. That's so. a huge span of time that she was active as well, from you know, the 1700s to, mm. to the 1800s. And a, a, a lot would have changed in that time, even, the, even in the, the years that she was working in this field and, and studying it. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about the size of telescopes and the way the the, the 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 speed in which telescopes has increased over that period of time uh, would have been would have been phenomenal. Some of the biggest telescopes in the world, I think the uh, the the Great Leviathan would have been constructed in that time, which is it was one of the uh, one of the biggest telescopes in the world, um, uh, seventy two inches, if I remember rightly, um, and that's in Beer Castle in Ireland. Amazing piece of kit, two stories high, and the wow. eyepiece is right at the very top of the eye. <laughs> so you've got to climb up all these ladders and use it. But that was a that was a great piece of kit. So she'd have been around probably when 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 that was certainly being constructed, and and the changes in the way that it was all viewed as well, I think, is a really important factor because um, astronomy has always had that. Or astronomy for a couple of hundred years had a real battle with um, with religion. 
Um, mm. And I know this is something we've covered in the podcast before. Um, and something that I think we should probably revert, uh, come back to at some point as yeah. well. Yeah, that was a fascinating topic, mm. that. And I, and I think, you know, definitely there's a lot more to cover on that. And because mm. if you missed it, if you cycle back through the previous episodes, we, we did do, um, as you say, an episode on how religion and, and science... Mm meet because obviously this the story of the universe and how everything was created mm. the you know, scientists uh, beliefs very much differ from from those of of the religious world so yeah. it's uh yeah but the, but there's also crossover where they where they do agree so it's yeah yeah and it's really interesting as well because if you think back to the 1600s when um or the 1500s and 1600s when people like Giordano Bruno were around. Giordano Bruno was famously known as the person who said, all the, all the stars are suns in the sky and they've got planets going around them. But he said this in the 1500s mm. before the telescope was invented. And um, consequently, uh, he was trialled on heresy and, and set fire to as a result of this theory mm. that he had. And then less than 10 years later, Galileo constructs a telescope and starts looking at stuff in space and... Um, the, the 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 thing that's seldom mentioned when we talk about these discoveries is the fact that these were very religious men as well. They believed that this was the way that their God would have designed the universe. Mm. It wasn't that they didn't believe in God. And this is what Giordano Bruno said right at the end of his life. He said, you know, I am not refuting anything here. I'm not saying that God isn't real. I just think that my God would not have created the universe like this. He would have done this and uh and anyway they didn't like that at the time so it was even religion versus what would have potentially been construed as maybe a sub-religion mm. at that time and now where uh, we we kind of separate the two almost but then as professor david wilkinson said there is a crossover and there is a relationship between science and and astronomy it just seems mm. to be that we think of it as not being a crossover yeah, no, it's 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 a fascinating subject all of yeah. itself, and I say it's it's probably something we should visit again because we've only done it once mm. uh, in the past. And uh, certainly, if you are a new listener to this podcast, then <clears throat> well, firstly, welcome. Uh, there are many things to go through, and 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 there's lots of things going right back to the start where we, we you know talk about life on other worlds, and mm. even those stories have moved on a little bit now because. Um, the James Webb Telescope, well, we spent a good deal of time like three years ago <laughs> talking about when this was ever going to get launched. And obviously mm. it is now launched and, it, and it's discovering all sorts of things. And even as recently as, um, you know, this week, the end of June, where we're recording this, um, James Webb has discovered a new carbon compound. Now, obviously carbon, very important when you're uh, looking for life uh, because of obviously the very building blocks of life. And this is exactly what they found. They found um, um, uh, traces of a carbon compound in space that forms all the foundations of all known life. And this molecule was detected 1,350 light years from Earth. It's in the Orion Nebula, which Ooh. is actually fairly local as, as yeah, the universe it's goes. nearby. Yeah. You can see it with the naked eye. Yeah, so we're not talking, you know, real deep space here mm. in, in, in previously uncharted waters, possibly is uncharted, uh, but, you know, re relatively close by. Um, it's um, methylcation CH3+, plus oh. for you molecule hunters out CH3. there. CH3. Um, so, so cross that one off. The molecule was uh, found in a young star system about 1350 light years away in the Orion Nebula. Uh, an enormous cloud of <clears> dust and gas with vast numbers of new stars uh, are being formed and it's theorized to be, to, to be particularly important because it reacts readily with with many other molecules that uh, molecules that we know about scientists mm. suspect it forms the the cornerstone of i quote interstellar organic chemistry oh now mm. that's exciting isn't it see this is the thing that interests me most in in astronomy to be honest i, I i've always said that i'm much more of an astrochemist than i am into astrophysics because um, well, first off, I, I, physics is hard. Um, <laughs> and it's, it becomes very philosophical as physics as well, whereas chemistry is a thing that you can see happening. It produces results. It blows up. It's um, something that you can take apart. And it just, 
it's it's more tangible. So seeing stuff like this and hearing things like this is is so much more exciting for me. And what's interesting by CH three as well is that if you if if we could stick in another hydrogen there, then actually you've just got a lot of fart hanging around <laughs> because <Christ>. that's that's <laughs> methane. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's one hydrogen atom, uh, one hydrogen nuclei short of a fart. Right. Um, but that's what creates um, the the organic chemistry that gives way to life. And I love to hear stuff like this because it 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 creeps us that extra step closer to understanding whether or not the universe can sustain life elsewhere. And sustaining life is very different to having the ingredients for life. And we've seen that um, certainly emerge more over the last 18 months in, in our solar system about, when was it, last April, so April 2022, um, f- some research that was being uh, done on on uh, carbonaceous chondrites, which are a type of, they're a type of meteorite, which are quite rare to find. Um, about one or two percent of all found meteorites mm. is in this kind of category of meteorite. And there was some research that was being done on a particular meteorite. Uh, I forget which one it was. But anyway, it, it came out that up until that date, we knew that there was some ingredients contained within within uh, space rock which could have been responsible for life. As we call them, the, the nuclear bases or the nuclear tides that make up DNA and RMA, RNA. For those who remember their GCSEs, that's the the amines, so the guamamine or whatever it's called. I always forget their names. But there's there's four things which make up DNA. Um, and there's a fifth nucleotide that you need for RNA. And RNA, of course, is the, the messenger of DNA. It's what gets it functioning. So we knew, we'd we known that two of those things uh, were present within space rock. And in April last year, it was discovered that actually carbonaceous chondrites contain all of those nuclear bases, all of those things that you need to create DNA and RNA. So the raw ingredients of DNA and RNA is present within space rock in our solar system. And then in April of this year, it was added, um, after some research that was done on, um, I'm sure you remember the the Winchcombe meteorite that oh, landed yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in the Cotswolds in, during the lockdowns. Yes. Well, that was one of the most significant finds in recent history for space rock because it fits into this carbonaceous chondrite um, category. And it, 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 anyway, the, the research came about that this contains amino acids responsible for life as well. So within carbonaceous chondrites, you have the amino acids, you've got the, um, the, the, the organic compounds and nucleotides that you need to create DNA. And that, uh, human, sorry, or, or life, as, as we, might just, uh, we might just put it. So the raw ingredients for life now we've seen beyond Earth and that kind of makes sense because otherwise, how did all of those ingredients get inside Earth to give way to life here? Mm-hmm. It's just Earth developed the chemistry to uh, arrange these things in such a way that they were able to resemble what we might call life. And when we're talking about life, what we're talking about is um, something which is able to take something in, produce energy with it um, and sustain itself. Um, most famously seen around these ginormous hydrothermal vents in the ocean where we start to see uh, proton chains taking place where uh, they start to resemble uh, basic life forms. And the exciting thing about that is that we think that those places exist elsewhere in our solar system. They must do, surely. Yeah. And not even, if not in our solar system, elsewhere, because yeah. you know, maybe we, we are all we know as far mm. as life is concerned. Mm. But we've got those same building blocks. They, they weren't necessarily exclusive to this planet. We just happen to be here yeah, exactly. You know. And and I think the interesting thing to add to that as well is that it's not just um, that we're kind of just confined to looking for life as we expect it to be, mm. when actually there's potentially life out there that we don't expect to be. I mean, James Webb is, uh, I was just reading that article there before that said, how does James Webb keep uh, keep finding things that shouldn't exist? The universe is filled with things that shouldn't exist in our eyes, 
because we don't know everything. <laughs> exactly. We, we don't we don't know how big the universe actually is, if, if indeed it is uh, an infinite thing or there's some kind of big wall like uh, the Truman Show at yeah, the end sure. of it all. But <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> what a disappointment. <laughs> and I think that's the exciting thing about, about this type of science is it is constantly evolving, constantly changing, constantly bringing us new things to consider and think about. And all of this understanding that we're working from, particularly when we're talking about physics... Although we have proved these things right, such as Einstein, Mm. etc., they still shouldn't coexist with other types of physics. There's two huge foundations of physics which exist, but they shouldn't exist together. Mm. But they do. And this is why things like um, what used to be string theory, now now M theory or whatever they've termed it now, is trying to... to uh, to attach these things together to develop the relationship between those two things and and that means that actually we don't really understand physics as what as well as what maybe we we should do or we mm. could do um in which case if something's wrong there <laughs> then the then the universe is wrong everything that we know about the universe could be completely rewritten and that's a weird place to be in i think of course the universe is right it says that it's our understanding yeah, it's just that's wrong, wrong. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm sure physicists would argue against me and say no we know everything about physics we know everything about it we surely don't there's, there's yeah. another story actually um and you can read about it on the on the Kielder observatory facebook um page about trappist 1c the um, Earth-like the, world. The Earth-like world. Yeah. But it's not quite Earth-like uh, because it's a little bit warmer than Earth. In fact, I think it's over boiling point. But by, even then, though, it's, it's a lot cooler than they thought it was. And that's the, the point of the story, that the James Webb telescopes un- uncovered mm-hmm. new information about this rocky exoplanet, TRAPPIST-1c. Mm-hmm. Um, it's orbiting around a, a red dwarf star, distance of... Uh, around 1.5 million miles there or thereabouts Very and uh, completing a circuit every 2.42 Earth days. Uh, but it remains relatively cool. It's just, a, a, well, a fairly mild 107 degrees C on yeah, TRAPPIST-1C quite... on its day side. Um, mm-hmm. So it's the coolest rocky exoplanet ever characterised by thermal emission. Um, the intriguing part, the story says, the, the planet's atmosphere based on the light The exoplanet emits, scientists have determined that it's likely to have a very thin atmosphere, or possibly none at all. That's very Um, good. But uh, they thought it it could have a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere, a bit like Venus, Mm. but obviously quite significantly cooler than Venus. Mm. It's interesting, if it's got no atmosphere, that would... I mean, that kind of makes sense, because I think we've already established that this star is quite a not very pleasant star to be around. So if you were on a planet around this star, it would certainly be coughing out all sorts of stuff that... Um, might rip away your atmosphere. I mean, that's that's kind of what happened to um, to to Mars when we talk about Mars being a dead planet. What we're referring to there is its internal geological um, processes have solidified, and that took away its protection mechanism. And the main protection mechanism that a planet has from its sun to contain it to to keep its atmosphere is a magnetic field. Once that's been stripped away, then all of that solar radiation strips away the atmosphere very slight, very gradually. So this could be what happened here. So it's, you can read more about that anyway, but also it, it's saying really that, you know, we, we are looking for alternative forms of life. Mm. Um, and, and, and this is another example of how a, how a planet might be made up elsewhere, an yeah. exoplanet anyway, with... Uh, very, uh, maybe a thin atmosphere, and if you can get, obviously, plant life can can breathe carbon dioxide in and 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 out. Uh, so yeah. you know, it uh, it shows that possibly there are forms of life. Life may not come in the form of little green men; it may come in the form of little green plants, little green plants, or or microbes, or something like that. I mean, I always talk about the extremophiles when we're talking about. Um, discovering new worlds and stuff like that. Extremophiles on this planet are fascinating. Even when you just look again just to our little tiny experience of life here, you've got things which live in lakes of acid, stuff that lives in alkaline lakes, stuff that lives in places where the pressure is unbelievable and sunlight never penetrates. There's no oxygen in some of these places where life exists. And you can batter them with radiation and nothing happens. So even on our tiny planet where they have these conditions where they could get to be comfortable, 
they still adapt to that really hostile environment. So if they've adapted to that hostile environment here on Earth and those places are replicated elsewhere, which we know they are, then it's reasonable to say, I think, that if life did get started, that it's thriving in those conditions. Mm. So. There is another story as well about um, black holes. People love oh, black holes. Black hole. <clears throat> There's actually one story which I... To be honest, I don't, I don't think it, it, it's, it's probably worth worrying about at this moment in time, but there's a theory and a new story going around, and I haven't got the story to hand, that what if, what if we, us, and everything we know mm. as space, that we are in a black hole? And... That you know that that that's one that's one um, theory that's been that brought up by someone. That kind of gets me thinking about. Uh, mm. There's a theory that um, that came about in the 1800s. Um, I can't remember if I've ever talked about that about this on here, but uh, it's called the Boltzmann brain theory. Okay. And uh, there was this professor, Professor Boltzmann. I forget his name, other than the Boltzmann bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was thinking about. Um, something to do with the age of the universe. And he said, if you leave the universe long enough um, just to decay away and everything, there's a point in time that you would eventually reach. Um, and this this point in time is, uh, on scientific notation, it's double exponent. So you're doing mm. it. <laughs> there's a lot of zeros on the end of yeah, this. Too many zeros <laughs> to worry about. <laughs> um, and when you get to that point, there's a point whereby the universe can manifest the human brain as something uh, complex mm. uh, to the human brain. That, that's, that's, that's one mystery, uh, which we can ponder on uh, without actually ever knowing the answer. The other one is uh, Sagittarius A, the supermassive black hole at the centre of the Milky Way. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, it, uh, they, they reckon mm. that it's only recently woken up, that it's been dormant been for, for the whole uh, of, of eternity. Um, mm. And, I mean, it's a fair way off. It's 25,000 light years. So it's a fair distance, but they reckon that only about 200 years ago, rel- mm. relatively recently, um, it, it started to devour gas and other cosmic de- detritus, as the official detritus. word is, within is its good. reach. So it's, it's <laughs> starting to, to get active again. Ooh. And it's, as I say, don't worry yet, we're not going to get pulled in next mm. week by this massive black hole. It's not going to swallow up the mm. whole universe as we know it. But it does seem to be uh, active and, and obviously... It being such a distance away, mm. word is is only sort of starting to get to the scientists now to work this out. But they reckon mm. it's been dormant for thousands and millions of years. And now, you know, we might have more news on this black hole at the centre of our galaxy. Having a little feed. Mm. Yeah, I think that's something that's worth um, just considering with black holes. Because we always, I mean, they are the doom of the universe. I love when you ask a kid to ask you a question and it's always about black holes it's just they're, they're oh. obsessed with the doom of the universe my uh, my daughter loves black holes in she? fact she well, i've asked questions on her behalf on this podcast and to be fair to her the great scientists and black hole experts that we've had on this podcast <laughs> not a single one of them has been able to answer the question yeah they're they're, they're really unknown things uh, a black hole. There's very little we know about them. But one of the things that we do know is just about how um, how gravity functions around them. And and we always think of them as as being this thing that sucks you in, mm. like it's like a hoover or something like that. But that's not actually the case. Is It's not there to suck something in. It's just if something gets a bit too close to it, then it's going to start gravity, become gravitationally bound to the thing and start getting pulled inwards towards it. Um, a little bit like, a little bit like a whirlpool. But mm. I mean, a whirlpool does kind of suck things in in a way. So, but it's really hard to think about that and think about the way that space has a fabric to it. And and I hear science communicators using this all the time. These terms of uh, the fabric of space time. It's all to do with the fabric of space time. What is the fabric of space time? You, you know, if you didn't study physics, nobody mm. would be able to think about that. Why Why the, the space around us has a fabrical nature to it. That doesn't make any sense 
at all. It's not something you can touch, is it, or no, see? No, it's, it's not. It's just the building blocks of life. I and it works in all directions as well, because yeah. then you can visualise it using things like gravitational wells, where we put a, a big mass in the centre and you can create an orbit around the thing in the middle because it's stretched um, the, the fabric downwards and created this this uh, thing that you can create an orbit on. But to be able to visualise that three-dimensionally and, and, and then work out how that functions, it's, it's just beyond human uh, contemplation. And I think that comes back to when we were talking about, the, just before there, about, um, about life and we can't imagine what other types of life can be like. I think that we are restricted in how we can look at the universe. We can't see these uh, dimensions maybe that this fabric operates within so we're limited in our understanding and and we always will be limited in our understanding about these things people love black holes uh we'll round off this section then with what what's your favorite black hole fact or or quirk <sighs> People love the black holes. My favourite so. fact about mm. black holes, which I still don't quite understand, which is why it's my favourite fact, is that there's a, there's a region around the black holes which you could liken to almost like a surface uh, on the black hole. Mm. And what can happen is, um, as we'll call it, a packet of information can appear within the black hole and then outside the black hole. Mm. And then the black hole goes... Oh, hang on a second. I've just created a particle or a, or a packet outside of me. That, that, that's not allowed mm. in the universe. So I'm just going to delete this one inside. And then there's a little packet of information that's been born into the universe from the black hole. And this mm. is something related to Hawking radiation. But I just love that idea of the black hole going, Oh, hang on a second. I've just created something that's duplicate of something inside me. Ah, I'll just delete it and get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> and chucks it out into the universe. Fascinating, aren't they? There's one where we're, black holes is another topic we need to cover again because, as I say, there's, there's so many things to do with them that, pe- that people uh, don't understand. I don't even get started on dark matter. That's, that's got its own episodes in the past as well. So um, <laughs> check those out at your leisure because, again, another uh, really infinite uh, topic, literally, mm. in many ways. Um, so before we finish, then let's let's have a look at the stuff that's that's coming up here at, at Keeldra Observatory over the the coming months as we head into summer. I mean, it does seem to be getting a little brighter here in in, in where we are yeah. right now. Um, and um, in this room, this is where you, you do some of your talks. And uh, what are the some of the topics that are coming up over? say July, August and uh, into September, I suppose now, if people are planning mm-hmm. ahead. Yeah, well, we always get um, completely full over over August um, and the back end of July and then into September as well, because arguably end of August, September is one of the most incredible times to do um, stargazing here in the UK because we get to see the Milky Way. The Milky Way is currently in its best position from now through to the end of August, but being here in the northeast, we don't get to see that at this time of year because it's too light during mm. the night. Um, but when we start to creep through into mid-August, that's when we start to get the Milky Way coming back. Um, so we're always we're always running out of space during that time, and in fact, um, um, the 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 we are thinking about other events that we might add on through the summer just to satisfy uh, more space or just to add in some more space and availability. There's some kind of irony there. An observatory should run out of space. Runs out of space, Uh, yeah, yeah. There you go. Do your own punchlines. Yeah. So we're going to hopefully do some more planetarium events, um, which won't be here at the observatory. They'll be elsewhere. Maybe the Kielder Castle. We've done those Mm. um, recently. We trialled those in the Kielder Castle where we had our inflatable planetarium and uh, showed people the night sky uh, in, in, in the castle in there. Um, and maybe some 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 other late night events. Who knows? We're, we're we're currently still still going through the planning process of that. But yes, my re- my recommendation is you need to book in your events now. Some people hesitate until the school holidays come, and then they've booked their accommodation in Kielder, and they think, oh, I'll just leave the observatory until I get there. Don't do that. Book now because otherwise <laughs> yeah. there won't be any space. They do fill up very 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 quickly, and we are limited to maximum. 
capacities and that's it. Yes. So. Okay. So get online to the website, kielderobservatory.org, and you can see all the available uh, sessions that are happening uh, with different themes, of course, as well. So there's different topics covered, different nights. So not every night is the same. So have a look and see if you can find one that's of a topic that uh, is something that you're interested in. Of course, the Aurora Nights are always popular. Um, Most and popular, yeah. And, and and later into um, you know August September maybe start of October time again uh, yeah. a good time for aurora spotting. It is yeah when we start to creep into the equinox that's when we start to get um, potentially more aurora activity um, so we might stand a better chance of being able to see it uh, in in northern England. Um, so fingers crossed uh, the this year is is we're starting to ramp up to solar maximum as well. So mm. this is. Uh, One of the more active years for the Aurora. We've seen quite a lot already this year. Um, And when the Dark Knights come back, I expect we'll probably start to see some more again. Um, And they they hopefully will become a little bit more dramatic as well. We'll get some good dramatic displays. Yeah. I've had some red alerts and stuff on my phone. You get these Aurora apps saying, you know, there's a a chance of seeing it. But obviously because it's so light at this moment in time, yeah, you're not able to see it. But it's certainly, obviously it's kicking off more than it it has been doing for quite some time. So um, whilst the Aurora sessions do not guarantee sighting of the Aurora with your own eyes, it's more of a session as to to what what causes the Aurora and Mm. uh, give you yourself the, the best opportunity and all the information you need to maybe go out and see it when the conditions are right. But there are other occasions where you have an Aurora night here and the Aurora does turn up. And, and those are yeah. rare, but uh, when they do happen, uh, that's globally glorious. I think it happened this year, actually. It did, it did, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah there was a, here, yeah. an Aurora night with Aurora and we were all surprised. Yeah, forget, <laughs> forget the talks, just go outside and have a look over there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's the Aurora night. So you, you do not get a, a, a guaranteed sight. No. Obviously, we can't no. guarantee that. But uh, it is a place where you can see it. It does mm. show its... Uh, show its little face every now and again. And I think that's the thing with the events here as well, is that um, we the, the, the event itself is designed to run regardless of the weather. Mm. Um, and we, tr- we really, really try hard to consider, um, to consider keeping people entertained, keeping people engaged for as long as possible, regardless of the weather. If it's, if it's clear, bonus. Yes, yes. <laughs> we we want to make sure that you have an experience regardless of that, which is why we spend time investing in things like developing the virtual telescope, um, the, the meteorites that we invest in, and of course, all of the staff time that we invest in in trying to get uh, the best from them for you as well. So that's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you see the weather's not looking good, don't think, oh, there's no yeah, point don't going. Be yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty that you can mm. do if, if the weather doesn't show up. Because look, you know, we're in northern England, we're in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very uh, hilly and exposed around here. Uh, the very nature means that, you know, obviously sometimes the weather is not going to be great. But if you have booked a session, don't think, that, well, there's no point because there's plenty of things that you can come and do and learn about and take those skills off to uh, use them somewhere else because you don't necessarily have to be at an observatory all the time to to see some of this stuff so you can you can Mm. see it wherever you are maybe that's it and i mean i was a guest i was (laughs) once and guess what it was cloudy (laughs) yeah i I, before i before i started volunteering i was a guest 10 times and seven times it was it was uh cloudy and and they (laughs) they said to me after the 10th time Dan, you should you should probably just consider like maybe volunteering because it was over a really short period of time, and so mm. I, I started volunteering, um, and uh, and then somehow ended up with the job, and then somehow ended up as director of astronomy. I'm not <laughs> sure how any of that happened because I am not qualified for any of this whatsoever. I don't have a degree in physics. I don't have a degree in a relative subject. It's just um, something which has developed over time. So. Um, so yeah, I guess there is a lot more to take from 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 coming here than just looking at the night sky. Yeah, so um, come down and uh, join us and uh, get all the information you need online, keel.observatory.org. And if you're listening to this as well and you um, you work in a school or, or something like that, um, there's plenty of outreach work that's done by Keel Observatory too. So um, maybe you can you can discuss more about those potential options of, um, uh, of of getting a session either in person or uh, virtually um, mm. at one of your schools or Virtual colleges. or mm. planetarium or come to the observatory or whatever. Yeah, yeah, we've got loads of, of stuff like that. Look at this little tiny spider. I just noticed it? that, actually. It's absolutely tiny. 
Yeah, it's a very See, small, this is what happens yeah, when, we're, when we're out here in nature. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, there you are, you see. There's something that you won't find anywhere else in the universe. <laughs> There's life. The tiniest <laughs> But it is, just look at it, it's tiny. And yeah. Just to think that Hey, that, if you discovered that, though, on another planet, that would be major news, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would be. Absolutely. Good it go. Well, uh, thanks for joining us on, on this episode of the Keeldra mm-hmm. Observatory podcast. Um, it's been great in person, I think. Uh, yeah. Do you know, we, we have all sorts of guests on, and, and, and it's, it's great to bring those guests, but sometimes, you know, the, the, some of the more, more listened to <laughs> episodes, it's just been me, just and, me you. and you rambling. Just me and you rambling. <laughs> on um, and and yeah so that's great so anyway look thanks for joining us and listen to the the previous episodes as well because we cover all sorts of stuff uh, including the aurora um, there's some good episodes about that so if you want more info about that just listen back to some of the previous um, ones that we've got um, also volcanoes on the moon uh, we've talked about that what better subjects than that uh, get, exactly great stuff and uh, much more about James Webb as well uh, from some of the people involved in the mission just mm-hmm. listen back to some of the previous Previous episodes, and don't forget to like and subscribe to the Kielder Observatory podcast. And if you do feel so inclined, leave us a review and tell mm. us uh, how you've enjoyed your experience of the Kielder Observatory podcast. Because other people might see that and go, "Well, that sounds like a good idea. I might want to download that." So, um, mm. on any app that you choose, if you do that, that definitely helps out too. And we'll be back next month with another episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast. Bye. So. Sure.